Hey guys, what is up? Kevin here with Mick the Coach, and uh, it is the Tuesday, January the 10th, I think. Anyway, it's good to be here. I am glad that you are here when, whenever you are here. Uh, there's a couple people here now. And uh, hey, if you're here, say hello in the comments. Let me know where you're from, all that kind of good stuff. Say hello, okay? Don't be rude. Say hello. Okay. Hey, uh, so before we get started, um, I'm still reeling in the fact that, uh, um, as some of you know, I'm from Alabama. And when you're at, when you live in Alabama, uh, when you reach the age of accountability, you have to choose between sides, Alabama or Auburn. <laughs> but honestly, I, they're both from Alabama, and uh, Alabama and Auburn are great. Uh, the Alabama-Auburn game was amazing a few weeks ago. Uh, the Alabama-Georgia game was amazing also, but it did not come out the way that some of my family probably would like it, or myself, actually. But Georgia played a great game. It was great to watch. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> um, a little saddened because of that, but hey, um, Alabama's a great team. Georgia's a great team. Anyway, okay, so today we're going to be talking about patch base. But before we do that, I want to mention to one thing that I just that I just started. I want you to check out. If you get a chance, uh, go to mixcoach.com forward slash free trial. And while that's up on the screen, I will tell you about it. So I just started a 30-day free trial of Mixed Coach member. Uh, which means that uh, until and it's not it's not uh, it's only until the end of uh, January or first of February, end of January, you can sign up for a 30 day <clears throat> free membership. And that means does it it doesn't expire at the end of January. It just means that you can take me up on this offer until the end of January. And then you have 30 days to check it out. Get to know some of the guys. Check out some of the tutorials. There's a ton of tutorials there. There's a ton of great mixtures there. And I would love for you to be one of those members. Um, if you're seeing this and you want to check it out, no risk at all to you. Just go to mixcoach.com forward slash free trial. Okay? Check it out. All right. So let's talk about patch bays. Okay? So first of all, <clears throat> let's talk about what is a patch bay. So, uh, and I don't want to assume that you know or don't know uh, about patch bay. So I'm just going to kind of um, just tell you my experience with patch bays. Okay. So patch bay is basically um, it's a panel in the studio where there's a bunch of patch points and you have cables. Let's see if I have some. I actually have some patch bay cables here. <laughs> Okay, I did not plan that out well, did I? <laughs> this is live, Kevin. Oh, I know that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. This is a patch cable, okay? So there is a studio, and there's a panel in the studio, usually in a rack, that has these guys. Hang on, let's see. And that's a call a Bantam or TT, which TT stands for tiny telephone cable. <clears throat> you also have cables that have this size on it. This is called a standard uh, quarter inch. <clears throat> that is a quarter inch. And if you notice, they both have a tip, a ring, and a sleeve on it. And you also have cables that you, you know you can have a, you can have a patch cable or patch bay that has a microphone in, a microphone cable like XLRs on it too. But those are really bulky and not that common. These are the most common. It's the one with the tiny telephone cable on, um, and they're slightly smaller. They don't take up as much room. But anyway, this uh, panel called a patch bay is in the studio, and everything comes to and from that patch bay. It's kind of like Grand Central Station. For a studio. Now, I had one in my studio, and I'll tell you about that at the end. Don't just hang out. I'll tell you what my experience with the patch bay and how much use I got out of it. Um, some of the things that I, that I did with it. But anyway, this is kind of Grand Central Station. Um, big studios have patch bays because they have several rooms, um, and each room is disconnected uh, physically almost. And, but you have to have patch points in those room to be able to interface into the console because you can't leave everything hooked up to the console because there's either not enough inputs or you might need to reroute some stuff around. So, um, so a patch bay takes those inputs from each one of those rooms and also gives you outputs to each one of those rooms. Now those inputs could be microphone inputs, 
They could be quarter inch inputs. They can be speaker inputs. They can be uh, Cat5 for you know data stuff. Uh, they can be video inputs. And all that stuff comes to a central location, which is called a patch bay or a patch panel. Now, I'm talking about mainly today, I'm talking about audio patch bays. Now, there are video patch bays and things like that, but we'll talk about audio today, okay? So everything comes together into this panel, and then neat, as neat as you can, or as neat as you will, uh, there's a whole row on the top there that says output from panels. And you might have drum booth, uh, vocal booth, uh, booth A, booth B, kitchen, bathroom, uh, main studio, you can have any of those places coming up into the side there. So you can already see how convenient this can be. Um, so, so right now, let me put a pin in this and let's talk about uh, a, a thing called normal and half normal. Okay. So if you have a normal patch bay, it means if you look at, um, here I go again, I'm going to, I've got a little patch bay here that I don't have plugged in. This is a this is a patch, this is a switchcraft patch bay here. And you can see in between the inputs and outputs here, sorry, you can see over the top is usually the outputs, the bottom is usually the inputs. So the top would be coming in from every point in your studio. Um, the, and the bottom would be either normal or half normal. Normal being that, um, that you don't have to patch a cable, it just comes like there's an invisible cable that comes from the top to the bottom, but that's done internally in the patch bay. Keeps you from having to use so many of these guys because they're kind of expensive and gets kind of messy. Um, you know, if you looked at the picture I've got on the, on this video, you can see how messy they could be. Um, so that's normal. If it's normal around, which means that you can still patch things around. You can still take, you know, input one from the drum booth and patch it to, uh, input 46 on the board if you want to. Now, if it's normal, um, it would mean that when you make that top patch, everything that was normal, like from one to channel one, is now broken and moved around. Okay. Half normal means that you can actually molt it. So you can actually multiply the output. So you can take, you know, output one from the drum booth, drum booth, and it can still be going to input one, but now you're kind of tapping off of it and going to input 46 on the board, whatever whatever you decide to do. So um, that's normal and half normal. Now these patch bays to make them very effective are normal and half normal patch bays. There, there are a few things that aren't connected to anything like effects, which we'll talk about, well, you know, or, or outboard gear. We'll talk about that in just a second. So, so now we've talked about the top row being the output from all the, uh, all the, the places in the studio and the row right under that being normal to certain inputs on the console. Now, back in the day in the studio that I worked in, we had patch bays like that too. But, um, you know, I, we had certain channels for, for everything. So input, you know, you know, input one through eight of the drum booth was normal to one put input one through eight on the board. Now you could, patch around that, but it, that it was normally that way. That's where normal came from. So, so, in it, so not only patching from booth to board, but you've also got insert points, which means um, now if you wanted to put an EQ, an external EQ or reverb or whatever on your kick drum or input one, then you can patch out of a normal uh, uh, or half normal um, to uh, an outboard piece of gear, let's say it's a 1176. Now you can patch out of the board into the 1176 and then output of that 1176 to the back to the input insert return. Those are called insert sends and they're insert returns. And, um, and so you would have another place on your patch bay where you would have all of your outboard gear, all the ins, all the outs, and you could at, Quit, pretty quick notice, take this and patch it into that outboard gear and then back out. And, <clears throat> and that's what, that's why people use patch bays, big studios with lots of outboard gear, lots of rooms, lots of cables. Um, so in, in addition to that, you can also have direct out of, um, of a, of a certain channel. Let's just say you wanted to send 
um, a more me, or you wanted to send the vocalist, just him and his headphones, and you had a, you know, um, a box that would handle that, you could just take the output of the vocal and patch it right into his phone, into his headphone box without really affecting anything. So you can see how uh, it would be really, really convenient, right? So that's the school I came from, where you work in big studios with lots of outboard gear, and you may have an orchestral session one day, and you may have just a piano vocal session the next day. So to have all of that stuff normal uh, and, and ne never moving it would be, you know, not it would be confusing right so you want to you want the ability to be able to patch things around plus these days even if you had an old vintage need you would probably find uh, a reason to, to use another outboard mic pre so mic pre's are the same you just patch out of the panel from the board into the external mic pre from the mic pre back to the board so uh, all those points are there in a well-built patch bay uh, so let's see um, another thing that big studios have with lots of outboard gear and lots of pre's and lots of big rooms and stuff is you are inevitably going to have problems where say one channel on the board is not working or one input, um, uh, from the wall panel in the drum booth is not working or it doesn't sound good or scratchy or got dirt in it or something like that. So you'd want to be able to patch things around bad channels. So those are, um, those are big reasons that big studios have big patch bays because you need, uh, you need to be able to reroute anything at the drop of a hat because the last thing you'd want to do in a big studio or your studio is to be, have to crawl around behind something or open the back of a rack and, and repatch something or, uh, God forbid you take an XLR cable and you drag it from one end of the room to the next to patch something. That just doesn't look good, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't, you know, really sit well with the client sometimes. And it makes you, you know, you want to get work done, so you want it to be efficient. So, uh, one of the reasons you have patch bays is because you don't want to be crawling under your board, trying to patch things and trying to figure out why things aren't working in the middle of a session. So, but here's the question: Do you need a patch bay? Um, and I will tell you toward the end. I can tell you that. Um, um, that I've had patch bays and then I have not had patch bays. And I'll tell you the result of that a little bit later. But so of the people here, um, how many of you guys have patch bays in your studios of some kind? You have a way to quickly route things uh, around in your studio. So I I'd love to know from you guys how many how many of you have patch bays. Hey, uh, let's see. I've got a couple of questions I'm going to take. Uh, let's see. had a question about... Uh, connecting a lunchbox to Apollo Twin. Let's see. Is there a way to connect Pro Tools output to Apollo console and monitor through there to reduce latency? Um, I don't use a lot of... Uh, let's see. I, I don't... I don't think there... I think that's kind of a redundant thing that you'd be trying to do. Let's see, finish your question. Do most vocals get compression after the mic pre to control dynamic? Okay, that's a separate question. We'll ask this. This one, I'm not positive that uh, that I can answer this. I know that uh, the output of your Pro Tools rig is going to have latency built into it anyway, um, depending on, the, on how you're using it. To me, the Apollo Twin, which I have one of those too, is another way to get out of Pro Tools. So you're actually using two, um, you're using two outputs, and you're routing one output to another out to another input so that you can monitor. I don't think that's going to save you any latency problems. I think latency is going to come from depending on your Pro Tools system. If you've got uh, an HD system which is has DSP built into the cards or to the to the hardware that they've got that reduces latency, Apollo also has that. Um, but, um, I, I think that you're, it's a redundant thing. I, I don't think you're going to see anything. The way to reduce latency really is to either go into and monitor from that Apollo twin to keep the latency down. Or if you have a pro tools system that will do that, you, know, you can run your buffer size way down too, which you're still going to have a little bit of problem, but 
you know, it costs a lot of money to get that latency out. I'm telling you. Okay. Let me ask you, answer this question. Do most vocals get compression after mic pre to control dynamics before going into Apollo? <clears throat> um, again, I think the Apollo, I don't know how you're using this exactly, but I use my Apollo as the input. So like if I, I use like there's four channels on my Apollo, I've got the Apollo duo and I've got four channels that I can use mic pre's from the Apollo, which is no latency going through there. And yes, I would use compression uh, after the mic pre, the virtual mic pre there. Uh, now, if you're using an external mic pre and you want to go into the Apollo on mine, there's another eight channels. I think eight channels or four, four channels, maybe even more than that. I think it's another four channels that I can patch an external mic pre into the Apollo. And then, yes, I would compress it there, too. But not a lot. I mean, only if you need it. I, I know that's kind of an open ended thing. Um, I, I, I don't know that I would just patch. Well, uh, on vocals, yeah, I would patch a compressor, but I would not compress it a ton because you're going to get some coloring and things. Sorry, same things that you can't undo. OK. Uh, and if you have a lunchbox, it's like you've got good mic pre's. I would just run them into um, a couple of channels on the Apollo, use a compressor on the Apollo. And then, honestly, if you're using the Apollo, you shouldn't have a lot of latency if you listen to what the Apollo is hearing and not through Pro Tools. Uh, and that's one of those uh, that's one of those uh, those open ended things that you really have to um, you really have to experiment with. Um, so hopefully problem or PRBLM, uh, let me know if I answered your question and do some follow up uh, questions if you have them. Okay. Uh, let's see, Bill, I had you in mind when I thought of this, Bill, how do you ground a patch bay and how, and how would you plug in a mic with a TRS patch bay? Uh, here's what I would do on that. You can, um, grounding a patch bay, um, I mean, you can get as elaborate as you want to with this. I've never had to ground a patch bay, um, but I've always, you know, I've usually worked in studios that had a patch bay that had good grounding system. Um, so I would say the simplest way you can ground a patch bay if you need it is just to, you know, take um, something. There's a tip. Um, there's a tip a ring and a sleeve. This part right here is the sleeve. And wh where this part goes is the common ground for everything in the patch bay. So I would find a point on there and just ground it to whatever, you know, whatever in your rack is that you need to ground it to. Most of the time there is a connection like that. Unless a piece of equipment is badly wired, you're probably not going to have ground there. But the ground is going to be on the sleeve part of this guy right here. Um, and okay, to your second question, how would you patch? How would you plug in a mic with a TRS? If you guys don't mind me uh, grabbing one more thing here, um, I think I've got some. Nah, I don't have one handy. But you can buy you can buy these patch cables right here, where one is this, and the other end is a um, an XLR. Uh, that and as a matter of fact, I have snakes made up that have all of these on one end and then XLRs on the other end. So that's what I would do if I were you, Bill, is I would um, I would just plug. Well, you're not just patching it into the patch bay. You're patching it through the patch bay to a mic pre. Uh, and I'll get to this part in just a second, Bill, with with, uh, you know, your your patch bay situation. So Elliot has a patch bay. Uh, hey, Elliot, uh, drop in there what you've got, what kind of patch bay you've got. Uh, many cents and some outboard gear, not enough ports in the interface. That's the reason you would have a good patch bay. Um, a lot of some people just want a patch bay because it looks impressive, and it does look impressive. When somebody walks into your studio, and uh, um, and they see the big patch bay, uh, they're impressed. And you know, I'm not going to discount that too much, but that's not the reason you should have a patch bay. So, anyway, oh, so definitely answer. Appreciate that. Good. I'm glad, man. Uh, thanks for the good question. Um, well, uh, Bill, you said, it, so it's not really necessary, question mark, I'm guessing. Uh, patch bays aren't always necessary. I'm, in, in the next section, I'm going to tell you the pros and the cons of a patch bay and when you absolutely need one. And I want your guys' input too, okay? So keep asking 
uh, keep asking questions. Elliot has a noise trick. That's cool. It's, it's good, good stuff. Okay. So, okay. Thank, thank you guys for being interactive. I appreciate that. I'm going to tell you a few pros and a few cons of, uh, of having a patch bay. Okay. So here are the pros, some of the pros. Uh, as we mentioned beforehand, easy access to everything in your studio or everything that's in your patch bay. Um, now, as with Elliot, you don't have to have access to everything, just access to what you need. So you could actually slim down your patch bay uh, by doing this. You don't have to have every point patched because that's a lot of copper, what we call copper, which is, uh, you know, this this part of the cable is really expensive. This part is really expensive, too. This right here in a big studio with 48 inputs and the tape machine, and a lot of outboard gear is probably one of, one of the most expensive things you're going to have in your studio is the copper, the copper that's in those wires there. And and then, you know, depending on how much of a nerd you are, uh, the like you can buy uh, oxygen free copper, whatever that is, and it's supposed to sound better. Um, or you can buy the cheaper stuff and, you know, you, you have to judge for yourself whether it's worth it, but you can spend a lot of money on it. So, uh, one of the, uh, so, so back to the con, uh, back to the pros, easy access to every point in your studio. Uh, if you, so if you wire it that way, uh, quicker transitions while you're troubleshooting. So if you've got a mic pre that's not working or it's got, it's noisy or whatever, it's pretty easy to patch that mic. Like, um, Bill was talking, patch that mic into another channel Set it the same way and you should be good. That can happen in 10 seconds or less if you know your patch bay and you know what you're doing. So one other pro is like quicker transitions while you're troubleshooting. Um, another thing, easily split signals. Like if you wanted to, um, now I don't recommend doing this all the time, but if you wanted to see what this mic would sound through, like through an API and a Neve mic pre, and you've got both of those, then just mult it, just Pull it, you know, you can mult the patch bay. You can either have a mult section where you have one in and four outs and it's just a wiring thing. So you can patch the output of that microphone and then patch one input to the API, one in input to the, the need and listen to them. Uh, you can, it's harder to do that if you don't have a patch bay. And if you've got a patch bay and all of these are half normal, then all you have to do is patch from the from the output of the sorry and see the output of the, the the microphone here into into this one if it's half normal it's going to go there regardless of what's up here and then you can just patch it to the next the next uh pre in the channel so it makes uh you know molting things and troubleshooting things molting things sending things around the room uh, a little easier and um and like i mentioned before another pro is it looks impressive um <coughs> excuse me sorry about that um I mean, it looks impressive for somebody to walk into your studio and you've got a patch panel there. And it's even more impressive when uh, when somebody says, hey, can we see what that micro sound like through this pre? And then you go, boop, boop, boop. OK, here we go. There, there's what we need. That's that's more impressive, too. It's more of a workflow thing. So, OK, back to you guys. Uh, I see some more comments, but I want to know from you guys, are there any other pros to having a patch bay in your studio? I want to hear your stories, too. Uh, let's see. Um this is dope. Thank you. I don't know what NGL stands for, but you'll have to educate me, man. Uh, let's see. Bill McDonald says the shields are what's important in the cables, question mark. The shields are what's important in the cables. Uh, I don't know that any one thing is more important than the other. I mean, th this is just my opinion. I don't have, you know, I haven't wired a ton of studios. I haven't used a vast a, a amount of different kinds of cables and could tell you the difference between this many ohms and this many ohms. I don't know all that stuff. I just know that I've worked in studios that have patch bays that work. And I've, um, I would say that the shield is just as important, but the shield is definitely important. But what a lot of patch bays are wired with is a, is a foil shield. Um, so it's just a little piece of foil uh, with a, you know, what they call a bleed, I guess, wire which is connected to the shield, but that's kind of what you connect and it, you know, physically electrically connects to the shield and that keeps all the extraneous noise uh, to a minimum. So the shield absorbs radio frequencies, whether it be from a phone or uh, radios or uh, radio stations or 
TV stations or whatever, kind of keeps that in, in that shield, uh, absorbs it, and then sends it to ground so you never hear it. Uh, so I would say that you, the shield, you're not going to hear what the shield does necessarily. You're going to hear what the shield kind of intercepts uh, the cables. I don't think there's anything more important. Um, um, I think the copper in the cable is what's important. The quality of it, maybe, or you, how it's how many strands of it. You can notice some of the really high end stuff has tons of tiny, tiny little strands of copper in it, and some of the cheaper stuff has bigger uh, wire in it and less of them. So, uh, let's see, Elliot. My memory isn't isn't that great, so I have to reference a schematic on a dry erase sticker on my wall to know where everything goes on the patch bay. I understand that, man. And that's cool. It's just called labeling. It just happens to be on a dry erase, right? A lot of people will take these boards and they, uh, these patch bays that I just showed you, the Soundcraft, and you can actually print out things like what everything is. And also being organized in like all the outs are on top and all the ends are on the bottom of a, you know, 96 point patch bay. If you can kind of keep that organized, it kind of keeps things straight in your mind. So, Hey, there's no shame in the game, Elliot. You gotta, you, I mean, if you don't, uh, label things. How, how's any, how is anybody else supposed to come in your studio and do stuff, right? So what's a good small patch bay? I won't have more than six external preamps. I'm going to show you that in just a second. Okay. SS by by how, how do you pronounce that? Let me know. Okay. Keep commenting and let me know. I'm, I'm reading these things. Hey doc, what's up, man? Good to see you. Uh, is your studio set up yet? Let me know. Cause I, I want us to go to lunch and I want to come see it. Okay. Steve. Oh, hey, Steve, man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know your handle there. Let's see. We've got some pros coming in here. Another pro is it increases the input ability for smaller interfaces. That is good. I'm going to jot that down in my notes. Increases input ability. I think I don't learn from you guys. I learn a ton from you guys. So keep those, keep those pros and cons coming, okay? Uh, okay, so... Now, and uh, definitely keep those comments coming, but I'm going to move on to the cons, the, the downside of having a patch bay, okay? And one of the main things is the patch bay is expensive. They're expensive. Uh, these, these, patch, these patch panels out here, I think three or four, even $500 sometimes. And then if you custom build one, uh, they can even cost more than that. Plus... All of this, there's a ton of this. If you think about, um, you know, 24 of these coming from each room and you've got 48 and you want to send and return from your uh, Pro Tools rig and then you want to have a big, huge outboard rack, you've got to send copper to all that stuff. And like I said early on, copper is probably one of the most expensive things you'll have. It's like, you know, in a kitchen, you want to think about appliances like I've got this uh, this certain microwave and I've got this uh, air fryer and I've got this stove and I've got. But one of the most expensive things in your kitchen is your appliances. I mean, your uh, your um, you know, your cookware and nobody thinks about how much the cookware costs. And you've got all this money invested in, you know, kitchen appliances, but not the cookware. It's like, you know, building a studio without good copper in it and without good patch panels and without good patch cables. Kind of, you know, you, you it, it adds up pretty quick, right? So, number one con, it's expensive to, to put this in there. Uh, number two, uh, the points, especially if these are if these are like this, then you have whoops, they can't be upside down. If they're like this, let's see if I can get this done. Okay, if they're like this, not much dust is coming in there. But some studios have them sitting like this, and dust and all kinds of junk gets down in there and those contacts that put together dust eventually works its way in between and causes the connections to go bad. And that's why when you put these in there, they, they scratch and you have to kind of exercise them a little bit and sometimes spray them with deoxid or whatever. I mean, patch base can be problematic because they get dirty over time. Uh, and when you, when that happens, there's more possible points of failure. If you have a guitar and running to an amp with one cable, there's only a couple of things that could go wrong with it, right? It's either the output of the guitar, it's the cable, or it's the input of the amplifier that's bad if you're not getting anything, right? When you add a patch bay and you've got all these normal and half-normal places, um, 
there's a ton of places that it could be wrong. And then you have to be better at troubleshooting um, uh, to figure out where the problem is. Okay. One other thing, and um, chime in with your, with your, the downsides of having a patch bay, those of you that have it. The th la third, la third and last thing that I'll mention is that it's a little limiting sometimes when you, uh, when you, let's just say you are dreaming up a patch bay and you say, I never have more than 16 pieces of outward gear. And then, you know, 10 years later, you've got 116 pieces of outboard gear. Um, you have to retrofit everything. You have to, you know, either buy new panels, like this Switchcraft is a really cool thing. Um, you have to buy new panels and patch those things in, and you have to put them in order. And if you want it to look really good, there's only so much cable that you have in the back there. You don't want it, like, wound up in there. So, and if you want to move things around, that I've got a friend, Lidge, who just rewired, rewired his patch bay, and it costs a lot of money to move it about five feet in, in his studio. It wasn't moving it across the room, moved it five feet, and he spent a lot of money unpatching, rewiring, all that kind of stuff. Now, he needs that because he's got a lot of, a lot of rooms, a lot of inputs. So, um, but, so it can be limiting. You have to, sometimes you'll go, you know what, uh, I've got an opportunity to buy these mic prees but where am i going to put them you have to think about that kind of stuff so they can be limiting so okay so uh let's see what you guys said if you have any downsides so doc just posted an update video yesterday ran electric and audio cable in the walls over the weekend that's cool i'm, I'm definitely coming to see you possibly this week i don't know let me know call me let me know if you're home okay uh, and I'll check it out. Guys, if you haven't checked out Dr. McFarland Studios, um, I have not been uh, paying close enough attention, but evidently he's documenting the um, the the install process, which I'll, I'm fascinated by that sort of stuff. I may use a patch bay at some point. Yeah, you don't have to have it from the very beginning, you know. So, uh, Bill, I bought an A-channel snake, which saved me money. Uh, yeah. Uh, those I have several of those too. A lot of those are TT or tiny telephone on the end, and like I said, quarter inch balanced or whatever on the other side. Okay, so one of you guys ask, what are some what are some alternate or what are some patch bays and what are some alternatives? So let's talk about patch bays real quick. I uh, I happen to be sharing my screen here. Let's see. I'm going. Let's see. Let me let me share this part of my screen. Real quick. There. Okay. I'm sharing Sweetwater tab. Now I'm sharing Sweetwater tab. Sweetwater is one of the one of the places that I go to, to check out. So this is a Switchcraft. Okay. And check take a look at uh, at, at what this thing costs. Now this is the one that I've got, I think, right here. It's a thousand forty nine dollars. Good grief. So you've got not only the patch bay there, but then you've got to buy these um, uh, these DB25s. Like on the back of this thing, uh, one of the things that makes it so cool. Actually, that's not the one I have. That's not the one I have. This is the one I have here. Um, that guy right there. And now if you look on the back of it, uh, sorry, that's not the back of it. Let's see where the back of it is. Oh, there's the back of it. Okay, so you, if you see these things, they have these things called um, uh, D subs, or some people call them DB 25s, I think. And anyway, so it's kind of like uh, you know, there's 24, 25 connectors there, and now you can buy these D, DB 25 to, you know, XLR or quarter inch, whatever you have there, uh, and let's see how much a DB 25 to XLR cable is. There it is. Okay, so there, okay, there's a Mogami. There's that's the oxygen free one I was talking about. You can definitely get cheaper than that, but that's one set. That's either the sends on eight of those or the returns on eight of those. Now you can go down to the Hosa, you, know, you can see that costs a lot less. And you know, nobody's going to see these things. And if you can hear the difference, then you should definitely do it. 
Um, but you've got, you think about this, you've got to buy uh, probably 16 of these things to fully wire your patch cable. Um, so, so let's, let's go back a page here. So this guy right here is really cool. That's the one I have and I don't have patched in yet, but as you can see, you can get cheaper versions of this thing here. Say you only need eight channels. Now uh, you were asking a second ago, what are some smaller alternatives? This is definitely an alternative here. And you can see that it's got, you know, one set of inputs, one set of outputs. So it's eight in, eight out, or four stereo in, four stereo out. And then you can see that you can do half normal or normal, or you can turn it here. And I think it's like fully independent. So this would be you know, how you would, you know, your set outputs would be from this thing right here. Uh, so, you, there's one option. I've got a, another couple of options too that I thought was kind of cool. Um, Samsung, let me see if I can copy this here. We go to this page here since I'm sharing it. So I found this. This is a patch cable. Now, this is quarter inch. This is this size. Um, so, if you, you know, you, it wouldn't work with these, you know tiny telephone cables you have to have patch cables for this but this looks pretty cool this is a patch bay that's got uh let's see if we can view it larger so it looks like it's got 24 outputs 24 inputs ever how you want to arrange that that could be plenty for you guys um that would be i mean that would probably take care of most things and also let's see see if there's anything on the back um Hard to tell if there's anything on the back, how it patches on the back. It's probably quarter inch also. So you could come out of your synth into that, and then it would be on the front. Now, as far as whether it's half normal or not, prob probably not. I don't know. But um, uh, let's see. Let's uh, let's copy this one, and I want to show you one more I found. So that's from Samson. Uh, here's an – whoop. That probably didn't happen right. Yep. Okay, let me try this. This is from Art. I've used uh, I've used some of these guys' gear before. Oh. There we go. One little, one little thing. Okay, so this is called a T patch, and it's uh, this could be plenty for some of you guys. And I don't know if, if you can rack some of these up together but there's your eight inputs so that switchcraft was 16 and uh yes eight output on the top eight output on the bottom this is half that size but you know you can see that it's uh pretty compact this may be all you need right here i don't know if you can patch it around or you know uh half normal or normal anything let's see let's see the back of it uh, I think the front probably looks about the same as the back. But anyway, uh, so there's a couple of there's a couple of uh, as far as copper and fit patch bays like that, uh, you could have that. Uh, if you're working in a bigger thing like uh, the church I used to work at, we had a lot of inputs from the from the floor, uh, from the production room, from where the switcher is, uh, from front of house. Had all those connectors. We used Dante, and I don't know if you know what Dante is, but Dante is kind of like. Um, audio over IP or internet protocol. Um, and that's pretty cool. And you can even take a, like a wave sound grid and you can have all your plugins there and you can virtually plug those in. But, you know, um, most of you guys are studio guys probably. So I don't know that you would necessarily, necessarily need that. Uh, so let's say, okay, let's go back to the, so there's a, there's a couple of options. Um, and then, okay. So just to end this up, um, I'll, I'll tell you about my experiences with the patch bay. Okay, it looks like there's a lot more comments that come in here. Uh, let me unshare the screen here. Besides the price, besides the price, all the patch cables too. You really need to know the distance, then position between the cable and power cables are an important consideration. This is, looks like it's coming from Elliot, who has wired a patch bay. And if you're thinking about wearing a patch bay, definitely takes some of his advice. Absolutely. That stuff. And you have to think about it because, you know, when you start talking about all those runs of copper, you know, you don't want a, a bunch of excess, but you don't want to cut it too short either. Um, let's see. Should be 90 degrees off parallel. Are you talking about the position of the patch bay? I'm thinking. 
Elliot, uh, Bill says, I've heard a patch bay is essential if you don't have a lot of channels and not as important if you do have a lot of channels. I'd say, I don't know if it's, I think it's how much you need access to the channels. Like if I was running a studio and you know what, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive off into this real quick. Uh, I've had studios where I had a big patch bay before and I spent a lot of money getting it wired. Um, and some of it I wired myself, which was, you know, um, depending on your uh, soldering skills can be a little sketchy. Uh, and I barely ever used it. I barely ever used it. Every now and then I would, I would patch, you know, from one different wall panel in, in one room to a different preamp. But it's almost as easy or easier sometimes just to go in there in my small studio, which I did vocals a lot, and move the mic out of one channel into another. And then now it's in the different channel. And then some of the stuff you can, you know, what problem was talking about, you, you know, you can patch different channels that are going through different pre's even. So I, I used it very little and I have been pretty, and why I haven't, you know, wired this patch bay in is I don't have enough external mic pre's to justify doing it. Sometimes I can just say, you know, the input one of my Apollo is this mic input two of the Apollo is this mic input three of the Apollo is, you know, and so forth and so on. So, um, uh, so, that's my experience with a student with a with if you're running a small studio and you and you don't you know need instant access sometimes you you you'd spend your money better if you put money somewhere else like maybe better mic pre's or maybe better monitors or maybe some headphones or something like that so all right so let's look through some of these questions i used samson before and it worked great that's good i haven't used a samson so uh that's good to know nathan uh, Elliot said mine's 24, 24 inputs and outputs. I'm guessing that's cool. Does the Samsung perform? Sam, oh, Samson, Samsung. I was going, Samsung, are they, are they not only making phones and refrigerators, but they're making patch bays now? Or you're talking about the Samson? Does it support TRS? I think it does. Um, let me, let me look real quick. Samson, this is the Samson. Yeah. It says eight points of balanced direct signals. Balanced is TRS. So you're good. I, I didn't show that, but I just read it to you. So, yeah, it does support it. Um, let's see. Ken says, have used patch bays extensively in previous church and in the analog days. That's the, that's the, that's the kicker right there because these days we've got more access to more everything, uh, and it's just virtual connections. Uh, doesn't Dante negate the need for this? It depends on if you're running a hardware outboard like uh, Ken, you know, um, sometimes I wish that I, I could have taken, I used to have a, um, uh, an LA, uh, LA, um, what, it was the Apollo, not the Apollo. It was an, it was an LA 610 and then a compressor like an LA 2A. And sometimes I wish that I could have taken the physical out. A mic and plugged it through that and then run it to the board. So if you're running that sort of thing, or if you've got outboard gear, like some churches still have, you know, verbs that they like to patch in. And in that case, and you want to be, and you don't want to just hardwire it and, and, and you don't have enough inputs, then um, it doesn't all the way negate stuff. Sometimes um, also Ken Briggs, if you think about the, the, the amp rack or the uh, input rack, in the back of the church, Ken, Ken goes to the church that I, uh, that I used to work at. And, um, there's a lot of, um, physical connections back there going into the Rio, which is Yamaha's input. And I've thought about before, and I can't remember this. You guys will help have to help me remember this. There is a digital patch bay now where you can patch all this stuff in. And then o over the internet, you can make patches. Uh, I always thought that would be kind of cool. So, so it, it kind of negates it. Uh, if if you're not using any uh, hardware outboard gear, so um, so Bill, you have a Behringer six P X three thousand. Let me look at that. Let's see, Behringer six P X three thousand. We'll take a look at that real quick. 
It looks like it's a pretty affordable patch bay. Uh, that uh, that looks like it would that like it would work pretty good, Bill. Um, I, it doesn't look like that you can uh, normal half normal, which I don't think is necessary necessarily, unless you're doing you know from the back of your board you're doing like uh, insert sends and returns. That's how you would use normal things. So that if you didn't have anything patched into a channel as an insert then it would just kind of come to the patch bay and then go straight back. Um, and that's another, another downside too, is you're adding a lot of signal path to your, uh, to your channel too. So um, the Neutrik 48 is only $98. That's pretty cool. That's the one you're using, but how do you wire that? Do you have to physically go in there and uh, touch every connector with a soldering iron? Because, I mean, you might, <laughs> this guy right here is expensive, but you don't have to solder. And, you know, if it doesn't work, it's not your fault. It's a, uh, it's the bad cable. So, but that's a good deal, man. The Neutrik 48 point, $98. It's good. Uh, let's see. Steve says, Kevin, very helpful. I like some of those smaller bays. Dante is amazing. Have to go have a session. Good. I'm glad you got a session, man. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, Elliot cables. Power and audio should not be parallel if you can help it. Okay, I got you. I tell you, and and not not so much. I mean, that's important. Definitely shouldn't be running those together if you can help it. That's where the shielding of the cable comes in handy. And also, I found that the wall warts, the um, power supplies that are come on everything now, even the warm audio eleven seventy six and all that kind of has a wall ward, which is a big transformer. And if you have that sitting in next to your patch bay, you can expect problems. Um, oh yeah, I, I got that. <clears throat> Bill, let's see. <coughs> There's switches on the top. That's probably all you need. That's probably all you need, Bill. Yeah, the no soldering slide switches. Oh, dude. I wish I'd have known about those when I was wiring my patch base because I bought the old switch crap and it had 96 points on it. And you had to unscrew every one of them and then solder, figure out how to make it half normal by jumper cables it was not easy at all so man they've come a long way on on these things on these patch bays so okay looks like i forgot to take this down uh we talked about cons we talked about alternatives to uh, patch bays and uh that's a that's about all i've got today guys you i mean seriously thank you for being here thank you for chiming in and i'm learning from you i made notes from you guys today i really do appreciate it I enjoy uh, this experience, especially when I've got really cool people in the in the chat section, too. So uh, one more thing before we go, I'll mention it in the beginning and I'll mention it again right here. Uh, if you want a free trial of MixCoachMember.com, go to MixCoach.com forward slash free dash trial and you uh, can get a free 30 day trial for MixCoach Member. We mix a new song every month. There are tutorials. I don't do all the tutorials. Sometimes the members do some of the tutorials, and I love that because I learn from my members too. Uh, so if you want to check that out until the end of January, uh, that's going to be available. Uh, so first day of February, uh, there's no option for a tree, free trial. Whenever you sign up for the free trial, you have 30 days to check it out. And I'll even do this. Uh, I'll even send you an email at the end of the free trial saying, hey, your free trial's up. And uh, that way you don't, you know, if you haven't logged in or whatever, you don't have to worry about it. I'll remind you, okay? So you have nothing to lose. So go, if, you have, if you're not a member or if you want to be a member again, now's your chance to do that. Free trial. Go, go say hello to everybody and, uh, and uh, take me up on that, okay? Hey, it's been good hanging out with you guys. Looks like I've gotten just a couple more comments. Um, let's see. What sh should Mike pre-level before hitting Apollo and will have to boost line level up in Apollo? Um, in the Apollo, there is a, there's a setting in your console that's either plus four or minus six. And depending on what gear you've got feeding that, if it's an API and it's got ballast input, it's going to be probably plus four. You set that to plus four and then you set the input of the Mike pre until you've got a healthy reading on your VU meter or on your LED meter in your Apollo and you should be good. Uh, 
Don't go for the gu- don't go for a Grammy when it comes to level. You want to leave enough room that if somebody sings a little louder than you expect, which they almost inevitably will, bass players play harder when you're recording them. Singers sing harder when you're when they're in front of an audience. Uh, so leave some room there, um, and uh, you should be good. Um, so yeah, make sure that that's set up in the uh, in the Apollo console. You can set each channel up for plus four or minus 10. Minus 10 example would be like um, uh, a CD player that has the uh, RCA outputs or something like that. So you have to you have to check that out. Um, and let's see, the, part, the second part of your question is, will you have to boost the line level up in Apollo? You shouldn't have to. You should leave the line level where it is. You should take the fader to zero, and then you should set your mic pre. This is just good gain staging practice. You should set your mic pre whether that's in the Apollo or whether it's an outboard lunchbox or something like that, then you should set your output of your mic pre as just enough to where you get a healthy level with your fader at zero. Okay. Um, Charles says, thank you. We'll rewatch now. Just got here. Thanks, Charles. Like your Les Paul on your, uh, on your channel uh, right there. Uh, Kevin, what was the name of the video program? The video program. Uh, remind me, Bill, which video program you're talking about. Uh, my memory is, you have to remind me, my memory, uh, I can't remember what it does sometimes. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, I, I'll give it uh, just another second. If, if we sign off before that, I will answer it in the, in the comments after, after the fact. Okay. Um, guys, been fun. Uh, I will bid you adieu. Thank you for all the great comments. Thank you for all the interaction. Love it. Go check out Mixed Coach Member forward slash free dash trial, and I will see you next week, okay?